Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome to a new week and a new session. Uh, let's just begin this time with a word of prayer. So uh, request any one of us to please lead in prayer. Any of us can please lead. Let's pray. Dear Lord Jesus, we thank you, Father God, for this wonderful day. Thank you, Father God, that this is the day that the Lord has made and we are rejoicing, Father God. Father God, this time as we are going through this session, Lord, we ask you that give us your understanding, Father God, knowledge, and help us to understand, Father God, that what you have prepared for us, Lord. And we submit Pastor Paul and all the students to your mighty hand, Jesus, that that we will flow to you, Father God, and with you, Lord Jesus. And we will accomplish you, Lord Jesus, what you have for us. We submit all things, and we ask this prayer in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. 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 Thank you, Abinas. <clears throat> all right. So we've been talking about uh, small groups, cell groups. Here at APC, we call it life groups. And we've Last week, we were talking about uh, the APC 12 model, right? So here's just that image that we uh, that we have here talking about how this this is the 12. I mean, these are a couple of life groups here. And out of these, we release people to start their own life groups with 12 people. And the reason we uh, also talked about why we have the APC 12 model is because uh, we figured that 12 is the number where I think you know each leader will be able to minister to uh, everyone on a personal level, right? There's there's an there's uh, you know discipling, there's commitment, there's at a personal level you can get to connect with them, and we also talked about. You know, there are different kinds of cell groups or life groups that we have, uh, some being only men, uh, only women, youth boys, youth girls, open life groups, family life groups. And so uh, the whole objective uh, to have these cell groups is not so that, you know, OK, uh, you know, uh, we have 20 or 30. Just, it's not about the number, but it's more about uh, a, a place where people can disciple and mentor each other. It is a place where everyone as believers, right? Each one of us, right? Uh, there's a statement that we always say at APC. Everyone is a minister and everyone is ministered to, right? So uh, each and every member of the congregation gets an opportunity to be ministered and also to minister to others, right? So it's very important that we develop this within our church, within our communities. Why? Because, you know, in a day and age that we are living in, we have this concept that, okay, the pastor's everything, right? Or the, the associate pastor, he's the next, he's the main. Right? It, it doesn't work that way gone are those days because now we've come to a time when god is pouring out a spirit on all flesh even children are beginning to uh you know are beginning to flow in the gifts of the spirit and uh you know we, we can be in the workplace monday to friday uh but god can use us powerfully in the workplace and also minister to many people so so we believe that each and every member regardless of you know their careers regardless whether they're in full-time or part-time ministry all of that don't matter to god it, all of us receive the same holy spirit and we all can minister to each other right so we looked at the apc 12 model uh and we stopped we looked at a few guidelines as well right uh when we when we are a life group leader or a uh, in a cell group, what are certain guidelines that we follow? Uh, and these are general guidelines, right? Uh, for example, each person should be safe uh, about opening up. Uh, then you got confidentiality, right? Uh, reaching out to family and neighbors. Then we got keep the interaction in line with Christ and what he's doing, refrain from storytelling. Uh, then we also got prayer as an area of growing, uh, right? 
uh, avoid avoid gossip, avoid murmur, uh, judgment, being judgmental, criticizing, and most importantly, always keep the vision of the church in mind. So it's not like the life group or the cell group is a separate entity from the church. No, right? The moment you feel that is happening, you feel that, hey, my cell group is, you know, people prefer cell group more than church. Stop at that stop at that track and uh, make sure that you align the cell group back to the vision of the church right and, and that's the whole purpose of having these cell groups and life groups uh, we also looked at a sample schedule uh, we talked about how you can you know have your own schedule this is something that we follow uh, and not all cell groups at apc follow the same pattern uh, uh, but this is just a general uh, guideline that is there available Right, so we're going to talk today. We'll begin from this. Uh, Jim Igley uh, is a wonderful man of God who has written uh, quite a few books, and uh, uh, he's written a guide for cell groups, and he has developed this tool called the upward, inward, <clears throat> outward model. Right. Uh, so as I keep teaching, uh, if you have questions, feel free to. Uh, raise your hand or feel free to stop you can stop me and ask questions or you can also uh, put it in the chat right okay so jim igley came up with this tool called the upward inward outward model now this is something that uh it's it's very bi biblical right and this is something that he has come up with to help cell groups to you know to really develop Right, to uh, grow in every area, right? So four simple values that every cell group can apply in their life, in, in, in the cell group, right? Both in their personal lives and as a group uh, as a whole, right? First one is the upward model. Matthew chapter 22 and verse 38 uh, says it plainly, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. So it's the upward model. So, so you're loving the Lord with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. So that's number one rule. That's the thumb rule, right? Then the inward model. Love your neighbor as you love yourself, right? So uh, in a church or even in, even in a community, right, uh, where God has placed you, you got to love each other. Because when you love the Lord your God, God's love is poured out into our hearts. And that love reciprocates or it, it is being released to people around us. Right? So that's the inward model. Right? The love from our heart flows out to others. Then goes the outward model. What does that love do? Oh, uh, out of this loving your neighbor and loving yourself loving people around matthew 28 19 therefore go make disciples of all nations right so it's it's flowing out it's going to become it's like a river it's going out and then the forward model teaching them to obey all that i have commanded you so basically go make disciples and those disciples go further on make uh, more disciples and it's a cycle that keeps going on right so let's look at it uh with a little more in depth right what is what is the upward model right this is the regular experience of god in in our lives right so when when people in a cell group encounter god this this encounter of God is based on an authentic passion for Him, right? So there's this desire, there's this yearning, there's this zeal, there's this, you know, uh, every time they they think about, you know, for example, your life groups or cell groups is on Wednesday. Wednesday morning, there's this desire of, oh, right, I, 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 today's cell group. I'm waiting to go. I'm waiting to see what God is going to do for us, right? Uh, the upward model. So you're not going because, okay, it's just some, 
you know, uh, you know, it's only fellowship. No, you're going because you experience the presence of God in that place. Right now, why is this important? Right, because remember that our walk with the Lord is not only community and fellowship with each other, but our walk with God is to grow and experience more of His presence in our lives, grow in intimacy with God. Right, so love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Right, uh, let's look at the inward model. The inward value is expressed by love for one another, one another in the group as cell members. Make heart covenants with one another. They become committed to living in community with one another. Now, what happens is this value, this you know, this whole uh, expression of love for one another is uh, it starts in the cell group. Or it can also start in the church, but it grows and it extends out, right? Uh, because it's not that life happens only Wednesday cell group and Sunday church. No, life is more than that. Right? It's outside of cell groups as well, right? Now, without the love of God in our hearts, uh, there there will be relationships but they will not be meaningful relationships. It's very easily forgotten. But in an inward model, when we, when we look at this, when we love the Lord, when we love people, and, and you know that you're, you know, there's this heart-to-heart -heart connection with one another, uh, there is no, nothing that is artificial. Uh, they say, right, there's nothing fake about what's happening there. They truly care for each other. They truly love each other. Uh, they truly want to fellowship and commune with one another, right? Uh, and I'm sure, you know, uh, if you look at, especially if you look at churches that are small, right? Uh, now, I'm not saying it doesn't happen in bigger churches, but if you look at churches that are, you know, probably 50, 60, uh, within 100 people, what is one thing that you notice in those churches? They're very close-knit. Right, very close knit. Everyone normally, right? Because everyone know each other. Everyone are there for each other. They know each other's problems. They know each other's challenges. They they care for each other. There's so much of connection, right? But of course, you know, God, you know, adds people into the church, and as we grow, become two hundred, three hundred, that connection may not be there, and that is why the cell groups here are important. So it's not like, you know, uh, you know, just coming, okay, I don't feel cared for, I don't feel loved in the church. No, you got an option. We got these cell groups. Why don't you go? Uh, you know, there are uh, relationships that can be built. Right? So it's wonderful. And I just want to share, uh, it, it's not to brag, but uh, this is something that I've noticed, right? One of the things I've noticed at APC is people may, you know, have a long Saturday, right? Uh, they may be very tired and, you know, uh, they may have had a whole day of work and got back home late at night. Uh, but one thing I notice is that on Sunday morning, even if they have to be there at 7.30 or 8 a.m., they are there, right? Now, it's not because they are there or, or because it's Sunday I have to be there, no. Because... You know, for many of them, it is a place where they have built meaningful relationships. Right? So they don't let go. You know, yesterday I was talking to one of our church folks and he was saying Monday to Friday, he, he travels on work. He's got his own business. So he travels on work and all of that. Um, and Saturday, he makes sure that he's back at, in, in Bangalore because he doesn't want to miss church. Uh, but he was, you know, the reason we spoke yesterday was because he wanted to, uh, you know, think of starting a life group. He wanted his children also to start a life group. Uh, so he was saying, this is a problem. I'm traveling Monday to uh, Friday on work. But it didn't, what, what I really was encouraged was that the, those 
meaningful he wanted to be back he made sure that saturday he's back so that sunday he doesn't miss out on that time of fellowship god's word uh being in god's presence so you see it's not something that is artificial it's not made up right as a pastor i'm not forcing i'm not forcing our member you have to come why you didn't come you know you have to go, give first priority to god nothing right uh and we praise God for this because people have built that relationship. They're willing to. I, I remember, uh, I think there's this couple, uh, the husband and wife, they they work the night shift, right? Uh, they've got, I think, two children and the children stay with their parents. Like they all stay together, but they work the night shift. So Saturday night they work whole night they're back at about 5 a.m 5 a.m they're back they just rest for a while they freshen up get the children two kids get them ready they you know get ready everything get the kids ready pack their tiffins everything and they come for the 8 a.m service and the reason, you know, one of the main reasons they come is because of fellowship and also because, you know, the children's church has been helping the children. So, but I was amazed. I didn't know that this is what they were doing. I just happened to talk to them. This is what they said. We worked the night. So I asked them, how many hours did you sleep? He said, probably an hour. Uh, and I was amazed at this level of commitment but I, I i see and they're not just coming and sitting in church you know the the wife is carrying one child and you know setting up the book table the other one is serving in the children's church you know in the worship team in the children's church and i was amazed at how you know when when we love god we do things not out of obligation we do things not because the pastor is watching or the leaders are watching, or I want to become a leader one day. No, we do things because we love the Lord, our God, with all our heart. And out of that comes an outflow of everything. Right? Uh, and so the inward model helps us to build these wonderful expressions of love with one another. Now, is it enough to love the Lord your God, have good fellowship, good community within the church. It, it has its place. It's very important, right? When you look at the book of Acts, it had its place, right? We saw that, you know, they, they met together every now and then. Uh, they met in groups. They fellowship together. They broke bread. They, they cared for each other, right? We see in the book of Acts, they met each other's needs, meaning even their material needs. They were willing, you know, people sold off properties and lands and gave to the those who are in need so we see all of that is important but what is the command that jesus gave us he said love the lord your god but he didn't say have it for yourself or be here be just be safe in jerusalem or just be safe in judea you know just grow within yourself now what did he say the commission that he gave before going up to heaven was go and make disciples, an outward model, right? Values found in groups that understand that they are, a, they are on a mission, and that mission is to go make disciples, right? So once that inward community, that fellowship is built, they understand, okay, now it's time that we go out and make more disciples, right? Uh, it is, this command to make disciples, it is not only imperative found in the entire uh, commission, but our mission in the world is, is, to, is, is a disciple-making mission. We have to lead others to Christ, disciple them, and lead them. And if you look at the book of Acts, all through the book of Acts, we see this was very powerfully portrayed and very powerfully done. Uh, look at uh, the great apostle Paul. He raised up many, many leaders, discipled them, right? 
Now look at Timothy. He found him when he was probably about 17. I, he trained him up. Disciple made him see his life. Right? Titus as well. If Epaphras goes on to Colossae. Uh, Philemon, who was, uh, maybe he didn't, uh, you know, really disciple him from small, but he was able to impact his life. Right? So there's many, many people. Aquila and Priscilla. Uh, and and you see that Paul raised them up to this place of maturity and released them to the call of God. He brought them to Christ and he made them be leaders. Now, Apostle Paul didn't say, okay, this person is a leader. I've, I've raised him up now. Now he's going to work under me for the rest of my life. Till I die, he must be here to serve me. No, we never see that. What did Paul do? He said to Timothy, he said to the church as well, and all everywhere he writes, he says, our dear servant in Christ, Timothy, our fellow brother, our co-laborer, he has the same spirit that I that we have. You see the 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 way he has you know trained up the next generation and and Timothy went on to lead the church in Ephesus, right? So our, as we grow, we love the Lord our God, then the, then, then the upward model, then the inward model, we grow in community, in Christ likeness, we develop. It's very easy to be happy there because it's a good feeling, right? Hey, everyone love each other. Everyone care for each other. We pray with each other. It's a good feeling. It's important, but... God has given us a commission to go and make disciples. So there is a commission to go bring people to Christ, lead people to Christ. There may be people who are believers, but they have no idea about God's word. They don't know what, what, what are the promises of God. They don't know their standing, the authority that God has given them. So here's, our, here's where we come in. Say, God, give us opportunities uh, to make disciples. Right, And then we see the forward value. The forward value is seen when Christ followers are taught to obey all things Christ taught us. And the entire forward centers on growing followers of Christ to be disciple-making disciples. So again, this is a multiplication. I raise up two leaders. Those two leaders raise up another two leaders. Those other two leaders raise up. To other leaders, and it just is this a cycle that keeps going on, it keeps you know, in, in forwarding it, just keeps going on. So, this is what Jim Igley has written. And when we apply these four values in, 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 our, in our life, and even in our cell groups, in our churches, in our ministries, we will really see that God will begin to work. We will see. A move of God in such a way that people will really, you know, uh, want to be in your life groups. They will want to come. You don't have to force people, right? Uh, you don't have to say, come, why you're not coming. You don't have to do all that. But why? Because it's all reciprocating from love. And God will lead the people to come, right? So maybe some of us, you know, uh, are planning to start a ministry, you're planning to start a cell group or a small group, uh, apply this, right? Uh, don't be discouraged, hey, nobody's come. It's all right. You know, the Bible also talks about do not despise small beginnings, meager beginnings, right? So don't despise it, but continue to do this upward model. Love the Lord with all your heart. Love people. Genuinely care for them. Have this mission in mind that I'm going to make disciples and let those disciples continue to make other disciples, right? Uh, so if, if any of you are planning to start or you already have a ministry and you want to see the ministry grow, you want to see God move, uh, maybe it's time you go back uh, and, you know, probably look at these four values, develop on them. And I'm sure the Lord will, you know, bring people to you. Right. And the best part is you don't have to force people. Really, you don't have to force because, you know, I remember early days uh, uh, when when I when I began to in ministry, I would I would always tell people. I mean, follow up is good, 
calling, checking on them. That's good. But I, you know, what I used to do, I say, why didn't you come to church? You know, we, you, you know, it's only one Sunday in a, in a week, just one and a half hours or two hours, you know, in a week, just keep it aside, avoid other things, you know, um, or you can always, you know, go out with family on Saturdays or Sunday after church, you can go. I used to literally tell the church people this way. And I realized that, hey, I need to stop this. Uh, and I thank God for the Holy Spirit who, who's, who you know, brought this to my attention. So don't do something that is forcing people. Don't, don't put pressure on them. Let the Spirit of God work and people themselves will come. Right? And then I began to really spend time in God's word, really spend time in his presence and pray for God to, you know, uh, let there be miracles, let there be healings, let there be words of knowledge, prophetic words. So I began to ask God to flow in all of this. And sure enough, over time, people started coming. I didn't have to force them. Right? Uh, I remember COVID time, we went online in... Uh, you know, cell groups and also be, I was in Mangalore at that time. So the church in Mangalore as well. Uh, we said, hey, can we do something on Zoom? Uh, and to my surprise, everyone joined. I just said, you know, all I said was, hey, shall we pray on Wednesdays and uh, Sundays we can also meet and, you know, probably break bed, uh, partake in the Lord's table together. Everyone joined. I didn't have to force them. I didn't have to ask them. You know, some of them, uh, had no idea about Zoom because a lot of them were retired uh, senior citizens. They they didn't have an idea. So what they would do, they would call and ask, how do I download Zoom? How do I connect? Uh, we didn't ask them. Right? Uh, oh, do you know how to get into Zoom? Do you No, they did everything. And I saw the shift. Right? The initial time, I used to force them, hey, why don't you come? But I saw the shift. People were coming on their own. Why? Because the presence of God, the Spirit of God, is able to minister to them. It's not a, it's not a fleshly driven work. It's it's driven by the Holy Spirit, right? Then let's get into how to lead a great cell group meeting, right? Uh, now these are just a few pointers. Uh, maybe some of us are already following these and. Uh, you're already, you know, you have cell groups, you've been leading a church or cell groups for many years. These are certain points that can help us. Right? Uh, first one is favorable environment. Right? Have a have a nice place, right? And it really matters. Right? Uh, now, for example, if you're having a youth life group, right, and you choose some place which is you know 20, 20 kilometers away from the city. Uh, it's very unlikely that our youth are going to travel 20 kilometers. So, so have favorable environments, favorable places. Right? Now, it could also be, for example, uh, if you're meeting in a coffee day or you're meeting in a, uh, a you know, coffee shop, <clears throat> uh, just make sure that you have a nice place. You're able to hear each other, talk to each other, uh, minister to each other, and you know, uh, the environment is favorable. Two. Praise and worship and a spiritual atmosphere. So when we start a life group, make sure that there's you know there are there's some time given for praise and worship, there's some time given for adoration, for singing songs, and just inviting the work of the Holy Spirit. Because sometimes what may happen is you know, we're so used to cell groups or life groups. Okay, we all meet, we say hi. Okay, okay, uh, you know, we do this. Okay, let's let's just sing two songs, uh, and you follow the routine, right? The the whole agenda. It's good, but also make space, make place for the Holy Spirit to work, right? So develop a, 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 a spiritual atmosphere. This could involve, you know. Uh, praying in tongues, singing in tongues, just uh, you know, um, uh, maybe an extended time of worship unto God, right? just lifting up His name, just thanksgiving, just uh, uh, praising Him for who He is. What happens? There's a spiritual atmosphere, and in a spiritual atmosphere, 
God can bring healing. When the glory of God comes, He can bring healing. They can bring deliverance. He can bring hope, joy, peace. There's so much that can happen. You know, many times, as a worship leader, this has happened many times. And I've gone to church, just led five songs, like what we normally do. Okay, choose the songs, prepare, pray, and come on Sunday. Uh, you know, do the sound check, everything. Lead the worship, and it's just five regular songs. We sang it probably many, many, many times. But there's many times where church folks have and church members, people who have come to church, have come and said, oh, "You know, this song really ministered to me." We may have sang it, you know, maybe fifty, sixty times in church. But why do they come and say that? Because there's a spiritual atmosphere. The Holy Spirit comes, and maybe just one line in that song has touched them. So more than the sermon, more than anything else, that one line in the song has really ministered to them. And they go back, such a hope, such a joy in their hearts. And so it's the responsibility of the cell group leader to, you know, uh, to get to pray and to encourage everyone uh, to you know invite a spiritual atmosphere in that place that's what it makes a difference right christ centeredness in the life of the cell right so don't draw attention to any person in the cell group now there may be a worship leader and he's leading the worship and all of a sudden you can feel this powerful presence of god this anointing, this 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 glory of God comes, and people are crying, and people are on their knees and weeping, and and, and just a move of God, a visitation of God has happened. Now, that's wonderful, but as a life group leader, don't draw attention to that person, or don't draw attention to ourselves, saying, "Oh, because I prayed yesterday for four hours, that's why today it's happened like this." What are you doing? What's happening is we are drawing attention to ourselves. Right? Even if I say it in the church, in the cell group, or you know what, you know why we are having this kind of a atmosphere today? Because yesterday I prayed for us. What are the I? Right? Self. Don't draw attention to yourself. It is God's grace that He releases, He pours out His Spirit. Or don't say, Okay, so John has led the worship and he has led so well today. Yeah, he, he has led. But it's not about John. It's about God. It's about God pouring out his spirit. So it's not about the chords or the guitar or the keyboard. It's not about all of that. Those are all just tools. But a cell group must be centered around Christ. Right. I hope you understand what I'm saying now. Uh, guitar, keyboard, music—it's good. It's important. Uh, you know, because what happens is if we say, "Oh, this worship leader did very well. He's the uh, because of him we saw the presence of God. He's a powerful worship." Now the worship leader will feel he's on the moon. Oh, yeah, I'm the closest to God. I'm the best worship leader. Hopefully not. Right. And what happens the next week? Life group will cell group will start. He lead us worship. Nothing will happen. Not even a breeze in the place. What what will happen? People are sleeping during worship. So what will this worship leader say? All his, you know, all that he's been thinking of. Oh, I'm the best worship. Everything go away. Right? So it's not about a person. God uses the people. You know, instruments and the songs, but it's the presence of God that makes the difference, right? So, as a worship leader, let that be center, right? And then, prayer priority uh, uh, pray for your pastor, pray for the life group leader, for the church, for the pray for the needs of the cell group, uh, and then pray for o oikos, which means, uh, which means immediate, uh, unsaved family and friends. Who are around us, who can be part of the life group, and who can, uh, you know, 
experience Christ in their life. Right? So prayer, basically have times of prayer within your cell group. And we'll talk a little more about why prayer is important in the coming chapters as well. Right. Uh, fifth one, delegation of responsibility to all cell members. Right now, this is again very important. It's a practical thing, but it's very important. Right. Recognize and giving opportunities to cell members. Now, remember, cell group is not a church service. It's not a worship leader and the pastor preaching, and then uh, in the end we pray and close. No. There is a place where everyone minister and everyone are being ministered to. So for example, you have a cell group. You have 10 young people in the cell group. Now don't make two people always do everything. Now give everyone else opportunities. And so you recognize, you say, hey, um, so last week, this boy had led the worship. So this week, why don't you lead? That person may say, hey, I'm, uh, no, I'm not uh, too good at uh, singing uh, or uh, I'm very shy say hey why don't you try it it's okay we are a small setting uh, with just 10 of us why don't you try uh, I'll you know you can make the other person play the guitar and why don't you try singing now you never know how good the singer he is he was just shy right then you look at another person you say hey uh, uh, can you can you you know just call everyone invite them for the life group you know, just say, hey, this week we're talking about this. Hope to see you at live group. Then you look, call, you choose another person. You say, hey, uh, why don't you be in charge of the prayer time? You write down five prayer points that we're going to pray this week. right? Then you look at another person. You say, OK, uh, hey, why don't you uh, be in charge of, uh, you know, uh, 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 just, uh, you know, just meeting everyone's needs, meaning, uh, uh, just if people have prayer requests, they can write it down, and give it to you. Something, some opportunity, right? And they feel that everyone is valued in the life group, right? Something. It could be setting the chairs. For them, it's a big deal. Right? Now, we may think, oh, it's a small thing, but for them, it's a big deal. You know, I remember when I started coming to church, my job was to clean the chairs and set it up. And I felt so valued, oh man, because I am setting the chairs, right? Uh, make sure that the chairs are all right and there should be a, the right gap between the chairs, right? Otherwise, everything's going to become a mess. So it needs to be set right. I felt valued in the church. I didn't feel like somebody who's just coming and going, no. So as we do this, as leaders, check heart motivation now why is this important right now there will be people who want to be known who want to do everything right they, they want to lead the worship they want to lead the discussion they want to lead the prayer they want to say the declaration they want to do everything right now what what is it when we have people that way check heart motivation why does he want to do that every time Right? Because probably he wants to be known. He wants to, there's a spiritual ego that it needs to be filled up every time. This this boy or this person, girl cannot sit quietly. Right? They want to be, of course, there's, there's a difference, right? There's zeal. There are people who, but the person must also be willing to do the smallest task which nobody will appreciate. Then you know the heart motivation is right. Right? So as you delegate responsibilities, be wise, prayerfully delegate. But as you do it, you know, give everyone opportunities. Make everyone feel important. Right? You can also say, you know, somebody to do the starting prayer, the ending prayer, the closing prayer. These are small things, but it gives them such a, you know, I remember I had uh, many many years back, as I became a believer, the, you know, I I used to go to the cell group, and this man used to say, "Paul, you pray, right? You pray." You so I, I'm just a new believer, but I didn't know how to pray. Now I don't know sanctification, justification, redemption, all those words. All I know is Jesus, 
thank you. So I used to tell him, no, don't ask me to pray. He said, no, whatever comes, you just pray. Uh, it's OK. But I felt so valued, you know. He said, I'm a believer for like six months, and he's telling me to pray. So what I did, I began to go to the Bible and see, OK, some, learn some good words to pray, read some Bible verses so that I can declare those verses during the prayer. It helped me. right? Uh, and so we can do that as well. Right? Being sensitive to visitors and unbelievers do not condemn other religions, other practices. Uh, now, the gospel is not about condemning. It's about proclaiming Jesus. Right? And I think as a church, we have to come out of this condemning other religions. Right? It, it, it's really sad to see that many times out of zeal, we make we say the wrong things. We, uh, we, we, we do the wrong things, and it's very. It's something that we must be very, very sensitive to, right? And there are plenty of examples that I can share, but uh, avoid condemning other religions. It may not make sense to us, but to them, it is something very sacred, or it's something that they've been growing up in. We don't say, hey, how can you bow down to an idol? It doesn't even make sense. <laughs> it's it's a stone. How? How can you do that? It doesn't make sense. Now, what are we doing? We're condemning. Now, that person can say, how can you believe in a person who died on the cross and rose again? Now, where is he? What do you say to that? Right? So it it's always, you know, it's about proclaiming Jesus. It's not about condemning. Right. Next one, uh, facilitating of the word, which is the most important part. Don't make it a sermon. Uh, you know this whole teaching one lecture. Point one, point two, point three. The people will go to sleep. No, be sensitive, be wise. Right. So how can you do it? Okay, there are eight points in the sermon. Okay. Let me see what I can do. First point, I love God's spirit to work. So it's not like I'm saying I love God's spirit to work and give one 10 sub points under that and everyone is sitting and listening. No. Right? So don't make it a sermon. What, what we can do is I love the Holy Spirit to work, point number one. So everyone, why don't, how does the Holy, how is the Holy Spirit work in your life? What has he said? What, what, what are the things that he has told you to do and told you not to do? Maybe some of you share, what are you doing? You're allowing people to discuss. You're allowing people to share their thoughts. So it's not one person talking. There's no PPT there, you know, projector on the wall and saying this is point one to 10. No, no need all those things, right? Let's make it very simple. Make it very open. Allow people to discuss, right? Okay, point two. Point two is, the power of God's word. So, hey, so this is what happened in my life. You know, I was reading the word, God's word really ministered to me and the situation, and I was able to overcome the situation. So, maybe some of you can share. Uh, and I'm sure all of them will have a story. Right? Sometimes, as leaders, we think only we have the story, everyone has a story. And we learn from each other. Right? So allow people to discuss, keep it open, ask questions. Now, the moment you feel a discussion is going, you're talking about the power of God's word, and somebody is talking about Israel and Egypt and all, then you stop the discussion. You stop it there. You say, hey, let's go back to what we were talking about. right? Uh, and that's where you have to put your foot down on certain things as a leader. After the meeting formally ends, meet up with everyone. You know, uh, if there are new people, just, uh, you know, get their details, talk to them, get to know them. And the last one, conflict handling and problem solving. There is no place where there is no conflicts. There is no place where there are where problems have to be solved. Everywhere, there will be some conflicts or the other. Now, these conflicts can be religious conflicts. Right? They can be because of a worship song. Two people can have differences because of a worship song. 
I don't agree to the song Psalm in, in the song in the book of Psalms, I think it's 52. Create in me a clean heart of God, renew a right spirit within me, cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord. That line is there in that song, and it's in the in the psalm. Now, two people will have a problem with it. They may say, Hey, this song is not good. Don't sing this song. Why? Because now David is singing in the Old Testament, cast me not away from your presence, written from uh, and take not my, your Holy Spirit from me. Now we are in the New Testament. Holy Spirit is always with us. So don't sing that song. Two people can have a problem with that. Now, as a leader, what you're going to do? Are you going to tell them don't sing the song? Or I, uh, who are you going to please? Right? What is what, what what is the best way to solve this problem? But you have to solve it. Because two people have a problem. It's a worship song. It's not about uh, jealousy, anger, nothing. Because of the song, there's a strife. So as a leader, you must be able to you know handle these conflicts do not sweep it under the mat and say okay problem solved because after two months the worship leader will choose the same song again and it'll become a problem again right resolve problems deal with it deal with the problem try to resolve it now how they respond to that is not under your control, but if they have matured and they and you know they they understand what's happening, and they will definitely understand and you know uh, be a part of what you're doing in the cell group, right? So let's take a break. Uh, we'll come back at ten o'clock and continue from where we stopped. Oh, sorry. I there's a question here. I didn't see it. We'll come back and answer these. Answer this question, Kennedy. Thank you.